Uh, my friend Julie Baker, who's the executive director of the Center for the Arts. Welcome, Julie. And Judy Nielsen, who is with the superintendent of schools um, as assistant to the superintendent of schools. She's representing education. Welcome, Judy. And John Blinder, who is the uh, President of the Board of the Nevada County uh, Arts, which is our arts, our local arts council, directly uh, sort of connected to the California Arts, arts Council, and Jeff Pauline, who is the publisher of Sierra Food Art and Wine, as well as the new uh, director for Go Nevada County, our local tourism site. Thank you. So welcome, everybody. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about what it is that social media is, what we're looking for in social media, in particular in rural counties. Um, the Digital Media Center has a plan to develop um, a, a series of NINGS sort of to, around communities of interest. And what defines a community of interest nowadays is something different than, um, than where we have to, you know, where we can geographically go. It's not just going to the coffee house or going to, uh, going to the center or going to a gallery. It's really about trying to meet and develop discussion online about matters of interest to our community. So the Ning model will develop around uh, things such as uh, sports and recreation, uh, seniors, um, uh, what else do we have? Uh, all, uh, different, different communities of interest that are intended to um, really develop more communication and get more people involved in our community in the arts. So. Um, it's important that we recognize that the concept of the Ning is not to replace something that already exists. For, for example, it's not a website, but it's actually a community forum developed to really get people who have not maybe been engaged in the arts more engaged in the arts and or to provide a forum for artists and artisans and people who are interested in the arts to connect and particularly to collaborate. And one of the things we're going to be talking about today is collaboration. So um, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to just kind of jump off and make a few, uh, have a few questions about what it means to collaborate and how we can utilize models such as the Ning to collaborate better. So um, I guess I'll go to, uh, I'll go to Jeff first and um, put the question to Jeff. And so my first question, Jeff, is if collaboration is such um, a, an absolute must in this day and age, funders demand it and everybody is talking about it and, and, and everybody's trying to stretch those dollars and leverage the dollars that we do have, um, how do you see collaboration happening amongst the different arts groups in our area? And in particular, how do you think that we could utilize social media? Well, first of all, I think that uh social media has revolutionized our ability to communicate in a small community like this. Uh, it's uh, inexpensive, it's ubiquitous, you know, almost everybody is using a computer now. Uh, there's so many uh, different uh, platforms, there's websites, there's uh, Facebook, there's Ning, and you know, a lot of these uh, uh, platforms have the ability to communicate with each other. So uh, I think that there's a uh, great opportunity. I think the key is collaboration, like you say, to um, there's a term they use in uh, Silicon Valley, it's called coopetition. And it means uh, that while you may be competing on some, you know, uh, you know, five to ten foot level or something like that, at the 30,000 foot level, uh, you're cooperating, and, and, and in a small community like ours, it's uh, imperative that we all work together because uh, rather than having Grass Valley versus Nevada City uh, versus Truckee, we're a county of 100,000 people, so uh, we need to work together. That's great. I want to um, talk a little bit about how that how how can we utilize a forum such as a Ning to develop more community around arts, and and for for your organization, for example, Julie, what would you see would be the potential of a platform like this? Well, 
Let me talk first about collaboration because it's something at the center we've really implemented in the last year. And one of the really important things is that there, we're, we are a small community. We are a rural community. We don't have large corporations here that we can look to for support. There are funders for rural communities, but not as many um, And so for a rural area. So it's really essential that the nonprofits work together. And I think there's some number that's uh, about 360 nonprofits or something in our own community. And there's just no way with 100,000 people in our entire county that we can all be successful and um, with, you know, sustain, uh, especially in, in this uh, really difficult economy. So one of the things at the center, which is a performing arts center, we do a wide variety of programming, almost 200 uh, performances a year. We've implemented uh, an opportunity for other nonprofits to collaborate with us on large events and um, and every time it's sort of customized to to what makes sense for them and then in 2012 we'll be giving actually ev a, a different nonprofit a, an opportunity to partner with us on a monthly basis and we're actually asking the community to make that choice and the way we're, we're doing that is we put it out on Facebook and we did an online survey so currently we've got about 130 different votes right now for uh, we we only have 12 slots available for nonprofits uh, to be selected, and that is the community is making that choice. We are not making that choice. It's really based on how the community wants to vote on that. So that that's one aspect of it. And then once we've selected those 12, they will be on our website. They'll be on our Facebook page. They'll be in our lobby. There still is that human-to-human -human contact that people still very much desire. Um, and they'll be able to really uh, expand their base and, and their audiences and, and awareness of their organization in that way. So that's how so one of the things that we're implementing currently. I really, um, we talk a lot about, especially when we're in the performing arts, um, as, as Julie is and, and I am as well, we really need to listen to what our community is interested in. And I really feel like the, the Ning and other social media give us the capacity to be able to, um, to have that sort of, that, that conversation instead of it being us broadcasting out all of the time it changes when you have social media to being a back and forth conversation what do you think about that John well in in relationship to what Nevada County Arts does we kind of came into being for what we felt was a vacuum of collaboration in the community and we're we are beginning to use the we've been using the, the Facebook as a social network site and announcing information throughout the county on our on our website and, and through Facebook. But we really, you know, kind of to echo what Julie is saying, we, we really felt the, the, the vacuum of collaboration and felt like if we could get everybody in the same room to start talking together to, to understand what each other's plans were, uh, to, to create a, an economy of scale that just wasn't happening before in this community, um, it's been really gratifying over the last couple of years, the, the work that we've been able to do. We've brought every one of the, the major arts organizations into it. We're starting new um, uh, committees with literary and visual per, uh, artists in the community. So we're really trying to, to bring everybody into the fold. So working with a Ning like this, <clears throat> as it creates a deeper and, and, and broader information, you know, working with us uh, and, and getting the information out, it sounds sort of like a very exciting potential new area, new way for us to be able to, to reach artists and reach the community to connect to how important the arts are in Nevada County. That's a big deal for Nevada County Arts is, is really, um, you know, not just branding for tourism sakes, but branding for the, the soul and spirit of the community and to get everybody to recognize what we really have here and what we've been having here for a long, long time. I'd love to talk about um, two things that, that I can pull out of that, and one is um, sort of the heart and soul of our community. And of course, the heart and soul of our community, for many of us, is our youth. And so I wanted to ask Judy about how she thinks that utilizing platforms like this and how the Digital Media Center can really help sort of bring more art into the schools and how can we work with the school district in order to partner with community-based organizations. In terms of technology, there are all kinds of things going on. And one thing that's happened and is happening currently with the Digital Media Center at um, the head 
of the helm is working uh, in particular with the high school um, and making a huge step forward in um, educating uh, the educators in our community because um, they aren't up to snuff. And um, so we are in that process right now, and Paul Minicucci is uh, being incredibly um, active and the catalyst between the Digital Media Center and the educational arena. So that's a huge step. Um, one thing that's happening, I know Grass Valley School District got, um, I think, I believe it's over a million dollar grant um, to take a step forward. In terms of the children, this is such a, an intuitive thing for them. Uh, when I was the director of the Imaginarium, we did um, virtual, I call them virtual reality field trips. And uh, where we as adults were on the learning curve, the kids would just come in and it was just an automatic thing for them to relate to this interactive live thing that was happening and they just suck it up. They love it. Yeah. They love it. And um, so, so in that regard, you've got the buy-in from the students. I, um, I can only imagine what that would be like, too, if we could utilize the Ning technology of, of giving kids a place to connect with people that maybe are doing things that they're interested in doing, um, creating mentoring opportunities with artists, um, filmmakers. Um, I know that, for example, my, one of my daughters is, like, really, really excited and interested in filmmaking. And if we had a platform, for example, where you could kind of mentor or hook up with somebody who would who would be interested in, in, in kind of seeing her along her way or teaching her something, that would be an incredible opportunity for her. Um, just to go back to Jeff, uh, talking about the you know how could how could social media and this sort of uh, this sort of a platform be helpful for tourism to our county because we did bring that up I mean we are creating something here of course of lasting value for the people who live here but this county does rely on tourism for one of it as one of its economic engines and so what do you see as as being a value uh, in terms of growth of tourism well first I think uh people need to understand that uh, the arts are a real catalyst to tourism. Uh, sometimes we think of a place as being a catalyst, whether it's a uh, historic downtown or uh, the Empire Mine, but uh, art events that we have here as well as the galleries and the artists themselves can be a draw for people. Uh, and and. I think folks need to understand that people who come up to visit a gallery or to see the work of one of their favorite artists uh, will also have dinner here and maybe spend the night and spend some money in some other shops. So the economic impact of, uh, of the arts on uh, tourism here is significant. Um, as for social media, what's great about it is there are no boundaries, you know, historically uh, you know, newspapers and uh, magazines to some extent circulate in a fixed area, well, whereas the Internet, you know, knows no boundaries. So, uh, you know, using some of the social media sites as well as uh, websites to communicate uh, your message is something that you can, you know, reach Roseville, you can reach uh, Reno, and, you know, at, in our magazine, uh, we had a customer call us because she had seen uh, us promoting the Mandarin Festival. She had moved here from Texas, and she had always sent those ruby red grapefruits to her friends, and now she had learned about the Mandarin, so that was going to kind of be her new uh, uh, fruit of the, of the season, <laughs> if you will. And, uh, you know, she learned about that through a social media connection. So there's all kinds of opportunities, and it's uh, there's no barriers to entry, and uh, the cost is inexpensive. So it's it's really a, a boon to communities like ours. Um, I would just um, want to go back to John again, and how do you see 
this concept being sort of complementary to the to the concept of an arts council um, and uh, having that public community forum um, would that is that do you see that as complementary to an arts council and doing and collaboration well this is a very new idea and so I'm kind of curious to see how it unfolds it, it intuitively sounds like a natural uh, the, the notion that one of the one of the things that the Nevada County Arts does, we we have a website which and and Facebook, um, which uh, gets us out into the world. This is yet another way to provide information. You know, we had we started, you know, in very small terms, trying to do things very well, but um, in a, in a very small scope. And I think this has the potential to add to the scope and the reach of what we're trying to do in, in a really uh, interesting way. But I'm. You know, I'm just learning about this as well. Um, you know, we've had a very effective Facebook uh, campaign uh, throughout our, our last year or so, and people seem to be really interested in that. And as Jeff so, uh, you know, eloquently put it, it's everywhere. And so how do we plug into the next phase? It's all moving so quickly. And to, to plug into what appears to be a natural ally to, to what we're doing just seems, uh, seems like a natural. Sometimes there's the perception that um, social media or or, or broadca broadcast performances, say broadcast performances, are, actually get in the way of live performances. What do you think about that, Julie? Do you think it's something that that things can work together? And, for, and I'll give you an example. They're they're um, broadcasting um, live at the Metropolitan Opera. And um, and we've had some um, live broadcasts of theater here as well. Do you think that that draws people away? Or does that entice them? Does that kind of excite them and, and grab at their interest? Um, <laughs> I I think a couple things about that. I, I, if, First of all, in our community, the Metropolitan Opera will not be coming live to uh, Nevada County. So I don't think there really is any choice. So the beauty of it is that that now expands uh, the audience for the Metropolitan Opera, which is, you know, as we know, classical music and, and everything else has been struggling. So I think it's great that it gets it into theaters in Grass Valley and a, and a child that would never have the opportunity to go to the Metropolitan Opera uh, would have an opportunity to see it here and to see it uh, for... A a very inexpensive price and in a comfortable place. So I think that's terrific. I think um, I have no fear that people are going to stop going to live performances because there nothing can compare to that. That that shared experience that you have in a digital way is one thing, and I think that that has grown, and we all do it, and it's really important in terms of creating dialogue, in terms of sharing information, in terms of marketing information, and and certainly our children today are absolutely in you know they know how to do this, and they and they're going to make videos and they're going to put those online, and some you're going to want to tell them not to put online, especially as a parent, but um, it is an important way for them in this Ning uh, potential for them to be able to, as a, someone who actually buys uh, talent and, and presents it in a performing arts center, I often am asked, how do you choose these artists? And, and uh, you know, we're going to get to a place where you're not going to see as many managers and agents in the future. It's going to become where an artist is going to be able to speak directly to a presenting organization or a producer. And, and that's an exciting next step for the artist, for the creation process. But I, I have no fear that live performance is going to go away because I think all of us can say there's nothing that compares to that. I think what we have to get used to, though, as arts presenters, is that uh, people are going to be tweeting when they're sitting in their seat. And instead of getting up and telling people to turn off their phones, you need to tell people to actually communicate while they're sitting there and, and get on there and say, I can't believe this performance is so great. And if the tickets are still available, come on down. Or, um, and all of that is how we build audiences and, and communicate in today's world. So most of the conversation we've spent has been around performing arts. And um, let's take a moment and turn the conversation to visual art. And is there, what is the role of social media with with visual artists, especially in a community like this where we have, um, uh, I think somebody told me, and it could be, it came from you, Jeff, that we have more artists per capita than any other place in California. 
any other county in California. So what is what does social media um, hold for visual artists? Well, first of all, I think it's a great uh, marketing tool. The uh, Nevada County Arts website has a new artist registry, which allows artists to uh, build a page, basically, that presents their biography as well as their artwork. And so folks who wouldn't normally be able to access that much information about an artist are able to, to do so. Um, I think the other benefit of social media is for artists to communicate with each other in a way that they can not just uh, share text, but they can share photos and their ideas. And I think, to me, that's what's exciting about this Ning project, is that you have an opportunity for a real grassroots conversation to, to go on between artists to share some ideas about their work. So uh, I think uh, it works on so many different levels, uh, but, but all told, it's really a, a positive for a small community like ours. Julie used to be in the visual arts. Do you have anything to say about visual arts and, and the use of social media? Yeah, I owned an art gallery for I don't know, 12 years or something. Uh, worked with a lot of artists, and I, you know, and, and I, I think again, it's it's a terrific marketing tool. Um, I think it's a great way for them to get the word out inexpensively about what you know, an open studio, a new work, uh, um, you know, a breakthrough that maybe they're having in terms of process. I think it's also a great way for them to learn about grant opportunities, things that they're going to apply for in order to um, juried shows, all of that sort of stuff, where they can share that kind of information. And, you know, there's there's expensive ways to um, to list that and get in, you know subscriptions to uh, to things like that. But once now we get into a community where people are sharing that information instead, and 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 arts uh, Nevada County Arts is doing that for visual artists in our community and, and posting that on Facebook. I think that is uh, really really val valuable to an artist, especially again in a rural community, because it's not going to be in your local newspaper about a juried show in San Francisco, for example. So love for it if you add something. To that. One simple comment is that artists tend to be on their own most of the time, and so our great hope is that by creating this kind of this artist registry and potentially with this Ning and, and this new technology and, and new new way of doing things, that we'll be able to get them to kind of come together more and realize the the greater power that they'll have working as, as a community, as an artist community, instead of just as individuals, although that remains to be seen. It's a challenge to get them you know, to come out and work together in that way. But that's my great hope, is that, that they'll see the, the, the power in, in working together. We just watched a really powerful video um, about a local artist and her um, abstract workshop. Um, Lil McGill puts on regular abstract workshops for members of the community, and it's basically a day where you come and you play with paint. And one of the things that actually struck me more than almost anything out of that was a group of people working together and the, um, the, the ease with which they had, but also... Um, the sense of, of doing something with purpose together as opposed to, as you're saying, sort of working in your studio um, by yourself. It was a really, it was kind of interesting. It was a very different way of looking at something and doing something, and it was really exciting. And I know that she does these for kids because we've seen those around the county as well. So um, getting back to Judy, Judy, what do you think about, you know, sort of, it, how how can we engage kids more in the arts, and it, what is what is our role as as people who are belonging either to performing arts organizations or um, or working with the media center? How can we how, how can we get kids more engaged with art and have that same sort of feeling that we just watched in that video? Well, I I would like for people to be aware that out of fifty states. California is number 46 in um, money allotted for the arts per student. And um, so once again, Nevada County is an incredible place that within the state of California, we're number 46 for money for the arts. But we have such an incredible wealth of um, 
talented people that are willing to share. And um, we have so many, as you mentioned at the beginning, nonprofits um, that touch on every entity, but certainly a lot of them are in the arts. And um, so the superintendent of schools office um, has um, an associate superintendent of curriculum, Stan Miller, and then I am his assistant. And 10% um, of my job is to support the arts in the schools and be the liaison between the community and um, the schools. So I can tell you that in terms of ethics and values, we feel that every student should have a solid art curriculum. Just as a baseline and an attitude and a premise, we believe that, we feel that, we know that, and for many reasons. Um, not just the intrinsic value of art, but also um, when kids are exposed to and involved in art, um, they truly are more well-rounded, they're creative thinkers, they know how to process, um, they work as a team better, they're, they can reflect, it, it's, and there's all kinds of research that supports that they do better in math, you know, all these kinds of things. So um, the issue always comes down to money, and um, I can say that we have organizations like Music in the Mountains that have a huge focus on education, and we will do whatever we can um, to to collaborate and be a part of that. Um, watching this video on color and knowing um, that that is about a local artist and that it ties into the National Gallery, I mean, all of that is so exciting. It's, it's just so exciting. And so then I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, how do we, how do we incorporate that? And um, so I'm thinking, wow, what if, you know, the kids got to see see that video and then the next day there was um, the artist not in the classroom but maybe being able to provide an art lesson or to talk to those kids personally. You know, I can tell you um, the letters that kids write to the organizations that support them are amazing. The kids just write the most amazing things. They are so inspired. They are so taken. They are so turned on. You know, just, just, just today I was reading a letter. Just one short thing was um, there was a student that, that said, I was sure that I did not like music and I wanted to thank Music in the Mountains for coming to my school. I found out that I actually like music, mm -hmm. and I'm so excited to know that about myself. I mean, that's huge. Yeah, one of my favorite um, letters that we received last week, and this was for the Music Live program, was, you guys are awesome. I think you should open a business and go on iTunes. <laughs> Which I thought was really pretty funny. It was pretty great. You know, and I think that is really going to be very important, that partnership with community-based organizations like the Center for the Arts, like Nevada County, for, uh, Nevada County Arts, um, like even the, the tourism website. I think that all these things working together are going to be absolutely critical um, when we talk about educating our youth, because the schools, you know, our, our schools here in California are not able to provide that at this point, and it's our responsibility to give, to, to be able to give that to our, to our kids. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody. I know this is a really broad-based discussion, um, but I wanted to thank everybody for like kicking it off today. I think there's a lot more to be said. I hope that we find out more about what social media and the Ning can do for it. And um, so thanks very much. And back to Paul Mancucci. Thank you very much to one and all. I appreciate the dis discussion. And it was very, uh, I, I think, valuable and far-reaching and far-ranging because it has to be, you know. And uh, I think we're going to learn as we go how to 
fit these parts together in the most efficient way. Um, but it's all about building community. It's all about building a, a cultural community uh, and getting people involved in that and, 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 and in the arts. So, Craig, thanks for coming up, first of all. I really appreciate it. For those of, uh, of, of our viewers who don't know, Craig uh, was appointed um, the uh, director of the California Arts Council about six months ago, eight months? August 15th. August 15th, whatever that is. But who's counting? But who's counting? Um, I want to start out by saying uh, I first met Craig, I think it was in Santa Barbara, but it might have been Sonoma back in 1977. Uh, Craig was working um, with Victoria Hamilton in Santa Barbara um, on uh, the opening of the Santa Barbara Arts Commission. The Santa Barbara County, county. Uh, Arts Commission. That's right. right. I did the first cultural master plan for the county, and Victoria was the first employee. Right. Um, and then um, uh, Craig uh, launched off into the uh, the cable business for, for for quite a while, and then I know came back and uh, headed up the Long Beach uh, Arts uh, Agency. Right. I had a, a detour from the arts, uh, though I kept my fingers in the arts even as I was in the cable business. But 26 years there, and then had the fortunate opportunity to come back in nonprofit arts and as you say um, the Long Beach Arts Council ran that for almost three years and then was contacted about this opportunity at the state and uh, delighted to say um, I'm I'm in a job that I love so far and uh, feel very good about yeah very good um, we're pleased and I thrilled to see your appointment really um, because for some of us I think um, the last administration uh, did not reach out to to certain communities in, in our state, and particularly in, in, in regard to uh, Northern California and rural. And uh, Craig did at one point, I, I'm t trying to remember whether it was running the uh, Rural Arts Network. Rural Arts Services. Services, and yes. Actually uh, got its start through a grant from the California Arts Council. Right. So I feel... You know, deep in my history is this agency which right. I now run. So I, I mean, how unique is that? And, right. And so it's been a very important part. And of And I think that's why we're so pleased in a community like ours because you really have demonstrated over the years that you understand uh, the needs and uh, you know the challenges we face in a community like this. Well, no question. And I think what's remarkable about all rural communities is that these are communities that are used to making their money go long distances. Every dollar has to be stretched, and people use that creative uh, uh, expertise in all their world, in all their work. And so um, we as a state agency uh, have done a lot, and you were part of this history, uh, to create arts councils, state local partners. Right. And so in 50 counties now, not 100% of our all, all California counties, but virtually all, there is a state local partner. And so the vast majority of those, of course, are in rural counties and far-flung communities. And so we understand, I think, deep in our, uh, our bones is a commitment to that continuation. Right. It may come as a surprise in hindsight that the creating a state local partnership was not always the most popular move that we made at the Arts Council. And uh, when I was there in uh, the 70s with the, the Brown administration heading up that effort with Peter Coyote as the chairman, uh, and we actually visited 57 counties of the 58. Uh, and it was quite a tour. <laughs> but I think you brought up the, the main point, which is uh, people – in the arts, tend to look at philanthropy as one way to um, to to assemble funds and resources, and indeed it is. But mm -hmm. we were more about connections and, and and actually becoming part and parcel of what people would think um, a, a county or a city should provide for the citizens: cultural services. And that concept was uh, pretty new at that time. I think it's probably a little bit more um, uh, believed in uh, these days. Um, because we're in a particularly, um, I would say, a, a fairly conservative county, and our board of supervisors, um, I think, get it pretty well that uh, you know that the arts are an important part of tourism uh, and need to be supported, even though we don't have a lot of money to uh, put that way. No, my and your to this, uh, my visit here is really part of my education and getting up to speed on this county. But my sense is from the conversations we've heard here tonight. 
uh, that people do get it and that there's a, a, an excitement and a, and a commitment to uh, making all those connections. So I, I think you're way ahead of the game in, in terms of some of the counties that I've seen. And there isn't always good, there certainly isn't always good alignment between elected officials, business leaders, and, and arts and culture um, tourism leaders, uh, certainly, a, as you would think there would be, um, because we get it. You know, we, we sometimes get caught preaching to the choir. Um, but when you have a community like this where something really special is going on, then we should be doing our part of the state to try to encourage it. Right. And, and we certainly do appreciate that. Now, t tell me a little bit about the impact that uh, working in um, – cable TV and access television, local television, had on you. But, but uh, how, how did that change how you looked at the arts? Well, early on, I mean, my, my introduction to cable television was when I was still working in the nonprofit arts world in Santa Barbara. And when small format equipment, video equipment, was becoming cheaper and available, and we were seeing that the cable television business was providing entree to artists and nonprofits to start getting involved in television. That was a very exciting and heady time. And so my first goal was to make sure that artists had access to the local cable studios and the local cable company. So before I made my step into the business, that's where I came from. Right. And so my earliest work in that in that area was to develop community studios. And I in the earliest days of a studio I helped build in Norwalk, some of the most amazing young Latino artists who are working in performance, doing some of the most avant-garde work. In fact, they, are, they today, a group called OSCO, uh, is represented in the Pacific Standard Time exhibits that are happening throughout Southern California now, funded by the Getty Foundation. And I was there in those early days, seeing that artists, when given the tools another set of tools. Uh, to them it was new. Now we take a little more for granted. But at the time, um, that was a perfect marriage of my arts interests and my newly acquired media interests. And that's informed me all the way along. And I've tried during my cable television career to make sure that artists and nonprofit arts groups had access to those tools. Um, how, how does the state, if at all, um encourage digital media, do you think? Have you had any experience or be able to talk to uh, folks in the uh, Brown administration about that? Hmm. Not so much the administration. I know that certainly digital media is, is considered um, an important candidate. You, this organization itself demonstrates that coming to the Arts Council, coming uh, certainly for grant support, but I think where we stand now is we're at a moment where digital media is really in the sweet spot of what's happening in uh, CTE, career tech, education. Um, in the recent bill that was passed that many of us fought against, actually, that Warren Furitani sponsored, where arts uh, could be substituted for career tech education. And what we perhaps could have done in hindsight is embraced that notion and seen digital media as the bridge. Right. I'm glad to hear you say that because that's exactly how I felt about it, which is, uh, you know, digital media encourages, digital media um, um, nurtures arts experiences, but digital media arts is also a discipline unto itself, and, and digital Absolutely. media is a tool just like a brush and paint is. Well, that's right, and certainly there there's a long history uh, since the 70s uh, of artists gaining access to video. Bill Viola, who's one of the most incredible internationally regarded artists who works exclusively in digital media, uh, is, is in Long Beach. So I got to know Bill, and, and uh, certainly he represents a, a sort of the penultimate use of the tools. And I think um, the young people who, we, again, we've reflected on that, that you work with, they're like they're digital natives, you know. Right. They grew up with it in, in their earliest moments, and so everything we do now, I think, 
to build on that uh, bodes well for our future. Right. I think that's one of the disconnects. But you know, uh, after I got out of the Arts Council, I've been working in digital media since uh, 2005. Actually, when I got back from Virginia Tech, uh, and what we learned was there's a disconnect that goes on in a kid's mind when school. Um, which is supposed to be about creativity, imagination, and learning, uses tools from the 19th, let alone the 20th century. And if you dare bring a phone into your classroom, uh, you're liable to get suspended. If you collaborate uh, on a work project, you're, you know, that would be considered cheating. Um, and I think digital media is the bridge into the 21st century uh, where we can teach kids those values of hard work and discipline through this medium as a connective device, you know. It connects people together. And surely they know, you know, the kids are uh, really savvy. You can't fool them. And mm -hmm. if if school is way outside their realm of experience in every other part of their life, they're going to drop out. And, and that's what they do. No, and I think some of the most important work yet ahead is to is to really draw a very direct line to connect those dots. And so... I think that's an area of research that we need to understand where are the um, the best where's the best work being done communities like this and others where there is a, a an active digital media effort to touch young people and we need to be studying those and promulgating the learnings from that such that we can really convince people it's a shame that they need convincing but they they do mm. and uh, perhaps uh, what has to happen is that we you and I have to get out of the way and turn over the reins to younger people who are, as I say, they, it's natural. It's a, right. They're natives in this field. Right. They get it in a, at a level that we just can't uh, imagine. And anybody, uh, we used to say, um, you, you probably remember when you go into a conference and people said, now, if you have a VCR at home and it's blinking 12, would you please stand up? Uh, that was sort of a surrogate uh, shorthand for, you know, Luddite. <laughs> and, and nowadays that the bar has raised, been raised so much higher than that. I mean, people are producing little videos on their cell phones. It's an amazing uh, transformation. It's funny you brought that up. I had a was invited to talk, and the person who had set up the talk said, Craig's going to teach you how to get that blinking off your VCR. <laughs> and so it was a running joke during the panel. The VCR was blinking, and the, the, the panel was wrapping up. And so the moderator said, so, Craig, how do you do it? And I pulled out some black uh, tape and just yeah. put it right over the, <laughs> over the front because I didn't have a clue on right. how to stop it from blinking either. So. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about leadership at the state um, arts council. Now we have uh, in Tom Torlakson a friend of the arts, and the first governor I heard actually run on an arts platform, uh, actually put some money into ads that said, I want to bring arts back to the schools. Right. Uh, I think we have a tremendous opportunity, uh, don't we, to make some change in education? We do, and it's a huge moment. Uh, Several of many of us think that this is a uniquely a unique window, and Torlakson is absolutely part of it. But you obviously also have in Governor Brown, even with all the constraints of a state budget that's a mess, you have a governor who believe, who gets it and believes in it. You've got a state superintendent. Uh, the state PTA right now is headed by a woman, Carol Kosovar, who came up through the ranks fighting for arts in San Francisco for her children. And she's developed some wonderful programs. And we forget the PTA is a million members strong. So you got state superintendent, you got the governor, you've got new leadership at the Arts Council. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not pointing to myself, I'm pointing to our council right now, <clears throat> voted formally to take 50% um, of our grant giving and, and devote it to lifelong learning and arts education. And that commitment continues. Um, you've got new leadership at the California Alliance for Arts Education, Joe Landon, who came mm -hmm. up through policy side and now is leading that organization. Um, you've got a coalition under the banner of what we call Create the State. And I don't know uh, if you've been watching it, but what we've done is pull together a group of powerful stakeholders in arts education to say, we cannot miss this moment. And so we have another convening coming up at the end of March. Um, which will pull together uh, business, education, elected, certainly the arts community, to say what are the, what are the critical policy issues that we need to change. Um, certainly fighting for arts in the common core and maintaining um, the standards we have. We want to tackle this crazy notion that we, we, we lost a dance and theater credential. You, you, when 
when the original legislation was written, as it's been explained to me, it referred to art and music, and that got improperly interpreted as meaning the visual arts and music. So we have those two credentials, but we still don't have a dance or a theater credential. How, that's wrong. We need, right. we need right. to fix that. And it's been right. a perennial right. argument. I have scars all over uh, my body trying state, to fight that so fight. I know you have. But, and, uh, but, yeah, it's but, true. But, it, it, but it, that's it, just one example of, I think, the window we have to make some of these things uh, fix many of these things right. that have been plaguing us. Yeah, because I think what people don't realize is they think art is disappearing from the school simply because leadership doesn't want it in there. Not, uh, school boards don't want to see art leave the school, but there's so many systemic barriers, you know, uh, testing, uh, the, you know, the AGG requirements where we only have one uh, opportunity to get an F requirement in fine arts for most kids, you know, uh, and if they're going to UCLA or Berkeley or wherever, they are going to uh, not be able to take more art than they, they want, let alone digital media. Uh, and so there, there are barriers when you don't have a dance uh, instructor, and you don't have a credential, you can't ha have a dance class. Well, and you, you put your finger on it. I mean, the, there, isn't, there isn't much disagreement now that n whatever the best intentions were of No Child Left Behind, it's devastated uh, education on many levels, and certainly the focus on testing, and focused on the testing in just math and English. So it's not only hurt the arts, it's hurt science, it's hurt mm -hmm. a number of, uh, of important uh, topics, uh, history as well, and so we've lost sight of, of what's important in creating whole children and creating a, a well-rounded child, and not a well-rounded child in, in the sense of just creating good people, but really making uh, uh, smart thinkers, whole uh, decision makers who, who problem solve, as artists do every day. The right. Artists at their best are about problem solving, and so those skills uh, put to the benefit of children every day is going to make them a better student. They're going to stay in school longer. We've seen the studies that say a child with four years of high school music scores 100 points higher, at least on their SAT scores. So it should be a no-brainer. But indeed, the system works against it, and we need to find a way to lower those barriers, mm -hmm. and the state has a role. Right. Uh, when I was... Um my last iteration at the Arts Council uh, in the in the Gray Davis administration, we did get to talk to Gordon Shaw, who was uh, from the Mind Institute, who did the Mozart study, yeah. uh, and it's a really interesting history because people very much misinterpreted Mozart makes you smarter. Right. Um, but what Gordon Shaw was talking about was deep inside the operating system of the brain is this thing called the sodium magnesium exchange, and it, if you will, you have a bunch of circuits, and they get closed. Mm. Uh, the piano sonata. For, uh, the, the piano sonata for two pianos that Mozart had that he used happened to be the perfect stimulus for opening spatial reasoning in the brain. Mm -hmm. And he studied, and he was not an artist or a musician, he was, he was a physicist. So he was trying to find these things out. And what Gordon said was, he said the irony of ironies is, is that what will save the arts in school is going to be science, it's going to be the brain science, and that this century is going to be about exploration of the brain, not of space. So I look forward to, uh, you know, to uh, using that kind of argument and finding the evidence there that arts are absolutely essential. Well, you may recall when um, I was working in the legislature that Senator Mello, uh, my boss, had done the correctional art program, which we guaranteed did longitudinal study was saving the state hundreds of millions of dollars a year because people who were, you know, did not uh, uh, recidivize as quickly if they had a solid background in the arts because they were able to come back into the community with new skills, seeing themselves in a different way. Uh, and yet it's just such a hard thing for policymakers at the state to grab, you know, get a, their hand, hands the, around it. The good news, Paul, and I'm glad you brought it up because that is a, that's a commitment we now have, is to try to recreate some of the glory years of arts and corrections. You know, California was known internationally for the quality of its programs in bringing artists not at just not only to adult correctional facilities, but youth facilities exactly. as well. And, and you're right. The research, which dates back to 1983, is still the best research about the lowering of recidivism rates. So what we've done, actually, is we're we're piggybacking on work that uh, Alma Robinson is doing mm -hmm. with California Lawyers for the Arts. You know Alma. Mm -hmm. And Alma has been a champion for, for that, that effort. 
and she has gotten funding to uh, work with some of the county sheriffs now with a realignment effort where prisoners are being pushed back mm -hmm. to county sheriffs and with that is coming some money and luckily the money uh, the state at least did the right thing by saying look once we give you prisoners we're not going to tell you how to spend the money mm -hmm. so to the extent that we've got sheriffs who also get it that the arts can be a re rehabilitation tool at the local county level we're going to work on some model programs to reinvest reinvigorate the arts and corrections mm -hmm. And State Senator Curran Price from Los Angeles, who heads the Joint Committee on the Arts, we just met with him this week, and he's going to be holding a high visibility hearing in this new legislative cycle to pa talk about the ways that we can support that effort to bring the mm -hmm. arts back into, mm -hmm. into that world. We, might, we should bring Bill Cleveland back from... Uh... Well, I was, in fact, you stole my punchline. <laughs> uh, Bill and I, for, for, your, for your viewers, Bill was the really the internal staff leader and, and really recognized as the leader of arts and corrections efforts at the state now lives up in Washington State. Mm -hmm. But I saw Bill recently at a conference and as we got excited together about this, he said, Craig, if there's a if there's a hearing, I'll pay my way down if I can help. So I think we'll have Bill down uh, to help us with that. Yeah, that would be great. He was a, a pioneer in uh, not only arts and corrections, but artists in other places and uh, pioneered work in uh, artists in uh, aging and elderly facilities, uh, artists in homeless facilities, Correct. Uh, and you know, making real change in people's lives through art and culture. That's right. uh, it's very exciting to hear, Craig. I'm so happy. I mean, uh, you know, getting Governor Brown back, it, it, people, I don't think, really understand how deeply he understands these issues. I mean, at the very core of his being. And uh, I know, um, funny story, one time I was uh, deep asleep, and uh, about 1 o'clock in the morning, Peter Coyote called up, and he said, um, and could you get down here right away? And I said, where are you? And he said, I'm in the governor's office. I said, Peter, what time is it? He says, 2 a.m. He yeah. said, but Jerry does his best thinking at night. You know, so I got in the car and went down there, and we spent about six hours talking about artists and corrections and, mm -hmm. and putting that program together with uh, Eloise Smith mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the very start of that program. So the governor understands the power of the arts uh, and uh, you know, so almost single-handedly saved the arts during the prep 13 years. Well, sure, and I remember uh, those early days in attending council meetings, and here was a council made up exclusively of artists, Ruth mm -hmm. Asawa, Gary Snyder, uh, Noah Purifoy, uh, Peter Coyote, um, Charlie Haid. I mean, these, those meetings were so fascinating, and yet it, it says that at its heart, at, its, at the DNA level, this state agency is about supporting artists. Mm -hmm. And so that's one also one of our very specific goals is how do we continue to support the work that artists do? So for instance, at our very last council meeting, uh, we um, funded uh, at $25,000 to the new teaching artists network that came out of early development grants that were given to Alameda County to start working on how to develop uh, standards and curriculum materials and professionalize the work that teaching artists do in going into the schools. Mm -hmm. One of the tensions that exists, and, and our school districts understand this, is that when working artists go into the school, into the classroom, the tension between the classroom teacher who may not have the same background or have the same set of experiences as the teaching artist, and yet the teaching artist comes into a setting and doesn't necessarily fully appreciate the setting that they're coming into. So that, that relationship is so important. So we're working at a state level to make sure that that network now is going to be statewide and we're going to continue to support the network of teaching artists. Um, I hope you um, might want to review the Local Arts Education Partnership Program that we had put in legislation because that was the heart of it, was that tension to try to come up with a way of um, figuring out what roles were what and how to get professional artists to understand what standards are and that they're not just, you know, they may think that they're intuitively bringing magic to the classroom. Yeah, it's, but not actually, show, it's not show and tell. Yeah, it's yeah. not show and tell. And, and actually it is connected to a, a, right. a you know, learning uh, sequence that the kids are engaged in. So right. I hope somebody does take a look at that uh, somewhere down the line. We've got a couple more minutes left. Uh, we want to come back uh, to to digital media. Um, 
wearing another hat of mine, um, the Digital Arts Studio Partnership, uh, we've been involved in workforce development and civic engagement as two of the main issues in uh, digital media. Uh, speak to me, you talked about CTE, because mm -hmm. CTE uh, is a... It turns out that digital this is a little story. Uh, four years ago, there wasn't a single CTE uh, class in digital media that met an A to G requirement. Mm. And now, more, more than 50% of them do. 3,500 mm. of them have mm. come into being in the last four years alone. And I think that shows you the power of, of, of career tech ed. Sure. Can you speak a little bit about how maybe digital media and career tech ed will will be a platform from which we can say this is an economic reality that the arts contribute mightily to our state economy. Well, there's some amazing work uh, being done to quantify just how important that equation is. Um, you're probably familiar with the work being done in LA and Orange County with the creative economy right. study that Otis College of Art and Design has done now for five years. And what those studies clearly show is that the total creative economy, um, it's, it's, it's re this last year we dropped from second to fourth, but that's partly based on cutbacks in, ar in architecture and, and some of the industries that use design. But still, the fourth and most important work sector out of 65 sectors in Southern California is the creative economy. And that's an aggregation that includes both Hollywood entertainment, digital media, uh, design, automotive design, fashion design, mm -hmm. the traditional art, art organizations as well. It's an amazing part of Southern California's uh, economy and what we're trying to do at the state is convince Otis, and we think we've got them there now, to take the study statewide right. and really help tell that story. But um, digital media, what's the beauty of digital media is, of course, is it exists in every county. There are practitioners who are working at home and providing uh, services to clients all over the globe. Mm -hmm. And we don't, haven't necessarily tied them all together, uh, but it's, it's the, it, it, again, back to that study, it shows that in Southern California, it's the one sector that clearly has a, a strong growth trajectory. So if you're talking to kids and to educators about where do the future jobs are they, um, what, what, are, what are the jobs that attract our children in terms of the things they're most interested in, Digital media has got to be right in the center of that. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us who have an interest in this to be part of the solution, helping push that forward. And I think we now have this opportunity with CTE, uh, the arts education community and the arts community in general has to say, hey, we are partners. Right. Let's make this stronger. Right. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Kathleen Milnes, uh, who heads up a lot of that studies you talked about at Otis. Uh, she serves with me on the uh, statewide panel, Digital Arts Studio Partnership. Mm -hmm. We've been working very hard to uh, to make that uh, and got pretty far down the line in the in the uh, Schwarzenegger administration, but uh, mm -hmm. funding problems and bureaucracies kind of killed it. But yeah. I know Sunny McPeak has started a new effort at the state level, so watch and see how that grows. Well, we're looking forward to it. And by the way, I think um, there are some other wonderful models. I know you're working on a model here in, in Nevada County, but um, I don't know if you know of the work that's being done through the YMCAs down in Long Beach, California, mm -hmm. where I came from. They now have a mandate, and they've received some significant funding to replicate a model that uses uh, college, as, college students as mentors with high school students, and they, they have a social entrepreneurship program mm -hmm. where they're taking on paying clients to produce video, websites, all mm -hmm. manner of digital media products. And I think it's another um, center of excellence to take a look at. Right. Uh, there is, uh, you know, many, many good islands of excellence in digital media, particularly in the southern state. Um, I think the question is how do you try to take that and put it into the classroom not only as a subject unto itself but a means of communicating in all subject areas because uh, so many classes uh, organic chemistry for example at the college level is now taught using animation skills you know mm -hmm. you don't understand chemistry until you can really animate uh, you know those bonds and uh, and the and valences and those kinds of things so you know we look forward to uh, you know building that into the schools we got about a minute left um, is there anybody who would like to um, ask one question uh, of Craig if they had anything on their mind that was burning? Issue? No? 
Boy, you put him on the spot. You yeah, know, I did. I, 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 I do that at, at time to time. <laughs> Um, but um, this is a new experiment for us. We don't really have uh, usually a audience for our um, our production. So, um, well, with that, Craig, thank you so much for coming up the hill. I look forward to working with you on a number of issues, and uh, uh, I'm sure I'll be down uh, knocking on your door. We've got some exciting things to talk about. Uh, uh, we do, and you're going to help us sell some more arts license plates. Uh, absolutely, and, we're going to uh, take that on. Raise $40 million for the arts. Wouldn't yeah. that be great? I think that uh, it, I, I think it's doable. I really do. We just have to have a considered full court. One in but... 32 cars. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. One in 32 cars. That would raise $40 million. Right. And that is in the hands of us, not in the hands of uh, the budget crisis or anything else. The people of California right. can speak and make that a reality. <laughs> Waited so long for you.